Okay, so welcome back to Existential Psychology here at the University of West Georgia. This video will be the eighth and final video we'll have about Jean-Paul Sartre. So uh, the category for today, or the topic for today, is going to be something that I mentioned pretty indirectly when we were looking at the distinction between the in itself and the for itself. And when we were making that distinction, I said kind of quickly, there's ultimately going to be a third category of being too, and that's the one we're going to take up today. And that third category of being is being for others. So here's where Sartre is going to take up the interpersonal and social realms. And he does it in terms of a phenomenology of what? Well, you know, what might be a logical access point for doing a phenomenology of our social relations? Well, you could think of any number of things, for instance. Well, you could say, how about a phenomenology of having a conversation? Well, I guess that could be one particular point of phenomenological access. Uh, but here's the thing, like in the 21st century when we live, it's possible to have a kind of conversation with uh, inanimate objects, like for instance in video games, when you have a kind of conversation with an NPC in a video game, that's not quite the same as having a conversation with a live person. But at any rate, uh, Sartre was writing this in the 1940s, and the thing that he picked, perhaps with, perhaps with some measure of prescience, because, <laughs> you know, video games would make uh, it more problematic to do a phenomenology of conversation in this regard. He picks the experience of what he calls the gaze. Okay, so what is the gaze? The gaze is the experience of looking at another person in the eye and having them look back at you. Okay, so he's going to be doing a phenomenology of that, reflecting upon that kind of experience and trying to illuminate uh, the underlying meaning of that with respect to the question of what is our being about. Okay, so uh, looking at another person and being looked at in turn. So what's going on there? Well, from the point of view of Sartre's analysis, first of all, uh, gazing at another person is different from gazing at an inanimate object. For instance, here's my favorite prop of late, this funny cowboy hat. Like when I look, even if I look very intently at this hat, it's very different from looking very intently at another human being and being looked at in turn. Why is that? Because when I'm looking at this hat, I don't have the sensation that there's another subjectivity looking back at me. But when I look at another person, I do. How it turns out is that uh, from the point of view of Sartre's analysis, there's going to be a double-sided dynamic to the experience of the gaze. And it goes like this. When we look at another person, we do so by way of looking at their physical body, which has an object an objective side to it. So our physical bodies are in a way like objects. They have mass, you can touch them and so on. Uh, but the difference of course is what we just mentioned, that there's a recognition when, we look in, when we're looking at another human being that there's also a subjectivity there that's looking back at us. Okay, and we know at some level that they're doing the same thing with us. So they're looking at us partly like an object, because our bodies are object-like to an extent, with a recognition that we too have a kind of subjectivity. Well, the thing about uh, being looked at as though we were an object, so the object-like side of the gaze, uh, means that there's a kind of threat, a kind of subliminal threat to our own subjectivity. Why is that? Because uh, when we're being looked at like an object, when we're being, in a sense, objectified, uh, it makes us feel as though uh, our subjectivity isn't being recognized somehow or being acknowledged somehow. Why is that? Because when we're being looked at like an object, there's the, the threat is that somehow our subjectivity is not important to that equation. So it, there's always some sense of threat in being looked at like an object. But the thing is that that's inevitable when we look at another person. Why? Because we, look, we do so by way of our physical bodies. So from the point of view of Sartre's analysis, there's always a kind of threat to our own subjectivity when we're looked at by another person. Well. So what do we do with respect to that subliminal sense of threat? Well, what we do naturally is try to reassert our subjectivity, reassert our selfhood, and how we do, do we do that? By staring at the other person in turn as though they were an object. So basically, uh, according to his, his phenomenology of the gaze, there's this very tensional adversarial kind of contest between two people that's going on underneath the surface between feeling objectified and trying to 
alleviate that sense of objectification by trying to recover our own subjectivity by gazing at the other like an object in turn, and of course that sets up their side of the dynamic. So ultimately, for Sartre, social relations, because he takes this experience as paradigmatic for all social relations and interpersonal relations, all interpersonal interaction and social relations are irreducibly adversarial, irreducibly competitive in a sense, irreducibly tensional and difficult. And because of that, in a different work other than, well, in a different work other than being in nothingness, uh, he asserts that hell is ultimately other people. Now, this is a line, it's a very famous or infamous, I guess, depending upon your perspective, line from Sartre that comes not from being in nothingness, but from a play he wrote called No Exit. And in the play, uh, the play is basically about three people, a man and two women, um, in hell, which may seem like an odd thing for you, for a, a self-avowedly atheistic existentialist to be writing about what hell might be like, but he does in this play. So we have these three people in hell, and it's not the hell the way you would perhaps traditionally think about it, like Dante's sort of hell with various circles and various levels of different kinds of torment and within the circles and all of that kind of stuff, or perhaps, you know, the hell of uh, John Milton in Paradise Lost, you know, with Lake of Fire and all of that kind of stuff. So it's not a traditional hell with medieval torments and, you know, people being eviscerated infinitely and all of that kind of stuff. So all we have is these three characters uh, moving in this kind of place uh, that Sartre has decided to call hell. And what we find out in the course of the play is that actually we don't need all of these ancient, uh, fantastic, Dante-esque torments to be in hell. All that's necessary for hell is to be right alongside our fellow human beings like these three characters in this play are. So uh, you're looking for hell? Just look to the sphere of our interpersonal relations. And that's in part, I'll give you another reason why hell is other people in a minute or two. But sort of the first arc of the analysis is that hell is other people. Why? Because our interpersonal relationships at a fundamental level are about a kind of adversarial push-pull uh, tension, a very tensional kind of relationship. Okay, so... Um, Hell is other people. Uh, and, you know, if you need a kind of, uh, that can seem like such, I guess, harsh sermonizing uh, when you first hear it. It's like, well, but if you want sort of a more everyday confirmation of it, like consider this, you know, when you think about all the different sources of pain and torment there are in the world, well, perhaps ones that you've experienced in your life, uh, well, you know, physical pain can be pretty bad sometimes. Um, you know, you break your arm or your leg or, you know, you have to undergo surgery and recover from it or something like that. You know, you can discover that physical pain can be pretty bad and it is pretty bad sometimes, but actually it's nothing compared to the kind of pain that your fellow human beings can mete out to you, especially across the emotional dimension, like emotional torment in a way, because it's on the inside. Right? It's like much more intimate to be emotionally tormented than it is to be physically tormented. Uh, and when you think of all the sources of emotional torment that can, uh, that can come out of your relationships with other fellow human beings, probably the worst ones of all come from the people that claim to love you the most. You find that odd or ironic somehow that the worst sources probably of your suffering in this life aren't actually physical. They are emotional and more to the point, they come from the people that claim to be in some sort of love relationship with you, like significant others, you know, you know, boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife, family, family, friends, you know, betrayal by friends. Boy, you know, if some friend betrays you in a pretty basic, painful way, that can make the pain of the physical body seem really small and really transient by comparison. So uh, if you need a confirmation of this Sartrean insight that hell is other people, I mean, look to the sphere of your relationships and perhaps more to the point, uh, the relationships that are 
the most intimate ones where you're more vulnerable. That's part of why the people that love you the most can tear you up the worst is because with those people, you're probably more open and more vulnerable than you are with random strangers. If someone, some random stranger pisses you off, you'll probably be angry for a few seconds and then you'll let it go. But like when a deep friend or significant other tears you up, boy, that can stay with you in a painful way for a long, long time. All right, so hell is other people. So also, uh, as a confirmation of uh, Sartre's analysis, uh, think about the experience of being objectified by other people. And like I said in your notes, I sometimes wonder if women can tune into this a little bit more easily than men, because the dynamics of objectification, I think, maybe happen a little bit more often for women, especially uh, younger women. Um, but at any rate, men can be objectified too and manipulated and all of that kind of stuff. So whether you're man or woman, like think about the experience of feeling objectified and first um, how unpleasant that is to be treated like an object, to be manipulated like an object. And uh, second of all, uh, look to what you probably do in response in one way or another. Try to reassert your selfhood. Try to reassert uh, the primacy of your subjectivity over and against whoever it is or whatever it is that seems to be objectifying you. So, uh, you know, if you need a little bit more everyday confirmation of uh, Sartre's analysis, you might look to those everyday kinds of experiences. Now, uh, the other reason why hell is other people uh, has to do with this whole business of bad faith. So, uh, it's not enough that our social relations are irreducibly conflictual, adversarial, competitive, and so on and so forth. Uh, the fact that for the most part we're doing this in various states of uh, denial of our freedom, denial of our responsibility, the ongoing project of making excuses for ourselves, um, and basically the denial of reality itself in favor of some kind of uh, fantasy-driven theater that we're not as free as we actually are, we're not as responsible as we actually are, that too is another locus of hell in human affairs, I'd say. And I think Sartre would affirm that too, that part of the, another reason why hell is other people is because we're so steeped in deception and lies that we tell each other and that, that ultimately, um, you know, constitute our social relations and our societies. Our societies are largely built on lies and deceptions we tell each other and the lies and deceptions we tell ourselves too. It all together generates a kind of hellish condition too. And so I would say that in addition to uh, you know, the gaze and the dynamics of the gaze and all that. We have this other source of hell, which is basically the hell that we generate by way of bad faith, of not being true to the reality of human existence. And uh, I guess um, to put a cap on the Sartre material, maybe it would be good to uh, spend a minute or two to point out perhaps some of the relevance of this for our 21st century world. And, uh, you know, you can kind of see the relevance of it in the 1940s when uh, during the Nazi occupation of France, people were in bad faith in all kinds of ways, especially in, mo in the mode of collaboration with the Nazis or perhaps profiteering, trying to make a profit out of that and so on and so forth. Uh, but in, I think in the 21st century, the way that bad pl faith plays out is, uh, I think it plays out largely uh, within the domain of wanting to think of ourselves as victims in one way or another. So within the, your reading assignment, Sartre claims that even in war there are no innocent victims. Well, how about in a 21st century commodity-driven uh, first world culture like the culture of the United States? Well, you know, I think that one of the odd things about that culture is that, uh, you know, trying to cleave to some sort of victim narrative and thinking of ourselves as, li as life's victims in one way or another is probably the primary, one of the, or at least one of the primary modes of bad faith, I think, in our world. I think that uh, a lot of, there's a lot of people in the world that are very eager for us to think of ourselves that way, as victims in one way or another, uh, who, const who consequently des deserve some kind of uh, recompense, I guess, in one way or another. But the thing is that when people ask you to think of yourself as a victim in one way or another, 
The question that I think you should have in the back of your mind is, in whose interest is it, really, for you to be thinking of yourself as life's victim? Who, in whose interest is it for you to be conceiving of your life that way? Because I think the ultimate answer to that is, it's probably not in your interest to think of yourself as a victim. Probably when you think of yourself as a victim, you're engaging, what's really going on is you're engaging in a kind of bad faith theater that ends up disempowering you. And here I'd like to bring uh, to mind that quote that I had several videos ago from Carlos Castaneda that I was using to exemplify this idea of Sartre and good faith. We make ourselves miserable or we make ourselves strong. The amount of effort is the same. Okay, so we, we make ourselves miserable, we think of ourselves in terms of victimhood and the dynamics of victimhood and the kind of resentment, the almost Nietzschean resentment that goes into that sort of thing. We make ourselves miserable or we make ourselves strong. We lay claim to our fundamental human freedom and we lay claim to our fundamental human responsibility. And we're not going to turn our attention to something other than that. That we, we remain faithful to the reality we're actually inhabiting and we become strong as a consequence. The amount of effort is the same in either case. We either make ourselves miserable or we make ourselves strong. And so I would say to you young people, my students watching this, like be very wary when someone is asking you to regard yourself as a type of victim in one way or another. I think like identity politics is, is full of this, you know? Like so when someone comes along and is trying to get you to think of yourself as a victim, could it be that the central thing going on there is a kind of bad faith disempowerment? You're probably not going to become stronger in who you are by conceiving of yourself as life's victim. You're probably gonna to have to step beyond that paradigm. You're probably gonna to have to step into the wider and wilder sky of reality itself before you learn to become strong. So let me end this lecture, and I guess this series on Sartre, with that sort of thought uh, for your young mind. Uh, we make ourselves miserable or we make ourselves strong. The amount of effort is the same. So the real question is, what do you really want to be in this life? Because at the end of the day, perhaps your choice of posture, your choice of attitude, your willingness to lay claim to what you really are is the deep source of all of that. Okay, well, <laughs> have a good day. Uh, see if you can take that one in. See if you can feel that one, if you can. If you have enough courage, see if you can feel that one. And in any case, I hope you have a great day. Excuse me. Oh, I ended the lecture with a burp. Uh, have a great day. So take care.